and I think we'll get things started. Um, so I'm uh, Lauren Valdis. I'm the supervisor that was working with Dr. Faith Zhu on her grand rounds today. And she's done a really fantastic job working through uh, both the evidence as well as the guidelines behind uh, spontaneous ICH, as well as taking it uh, steps further and consulting our local content experts for some of those questions that we can't find in the guidelines, we can't find in the evidence. And then also adds a really practical uh, component to today's presentation. So I know I learned a lot from all of the work that she's done, and I'm sure all of us will be able to take something away from her presentation today. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to uh, Dr. Zhu. And uh, yeah, thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll get started. I'm Faith. I'm one of the CCFPEM residents this year. I'll be presenting on emergency management of spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhages. Halfway through the presentation, we're gonna do a polling activity. So the instructions are on the slide here. Uh, you can use another link, another device, or use your computer. Just log into this um, H, uh, URL, pollev.com dash 649 We'll also post it in the chat. Uh, when the time is ready, I'll let you know um, when you can answer those questions. All right, so let's get started. Uh, I have to begin with acknowledgements. I have to thank my supervisor, Dr. Lauren Feldes. She's provided tremendous support throughout the entire process of creating this Grand Rounds. I'd also like to thank so many of our local experts. So our stroke neurologist, Dr. Alexander Ka, Dr. Jennifer Manzia, and Dr. Uh, Lauren Mai, as well as our neurointensivist, Dr. Tanel Gofton. They all took the time out of their day to answer my questions, and they've offered really great practical pearls and wisdoms, which I hope to share with you today. And then uh, all our clinical educators, so Jason Barreras, Camelo Jaramello and Cindy Cook, as well as Brian Zimmer, the pharmacist at St. Joe's, uh, they really helped gather intel on drug availability within our emergency departments. Okay, so objectives of today are as follows. We'll review the etiology, clinical features, pathophysiology, and diagnosis of spontaneous ICH. We'll analyze current recommendations and address clinical equipoise on aspects related to the acute management specifically as it relates to blood pressure, coagulopathy reversal, uh, hyperosmolotherapy use, other neuroprotective interventions, and then the indications for surgery. So to begin, uh, we're just gonna focus a bit on the nomenclature so that everyone's on the same page. Intracerebral hemorrhages refer to all bleeding that occurs within the skull. And then one way to categorize this is by the anatomical compartment. So you have your epidural hematomas, your subdural hematomas. These are typically results from traumatic blunt brain injury. And then hemorrhagic stroke can be further subdivided into subarachnoid hemorrhage and intracerebral hemorrhage. ICH, which I refer to as intracerebral hemorrhage, um, accounts for 75% of hemorrhagic strokes. They refer to non-traumatic bleeding that occurs within the brain parenchyma or deep tissue in the brain. It can sometimes extend into the ventricles and in ver very rare cases also extend into the subarachnoid space. For the purpose of today, we're just gonna be talking about intracerebral hemorrhages. All right, so spontaneous ICH accounts for 10 to 20% of all stroke cases, um, but it's the most serious, least treatable form of stroke and it carries a significantly greater burden than ischemic stroke. The 30-day mortality rate is approximately 40%, and only 20% of those survivors regain functional independence. So as you can imagine, there's enormous social and economic effects from the resultant loss of productive years. So why is it that I want to talk to you guys about spontaneous ICH? I think we tend to think quite pessimistically when it comes to this diagnosis, because it's terrible. The results are usually devastating, the prognosis is poor, and the treatment options are limited. But I think holding on to this pessimistic view can inadvertently and sometimes subconsciously lead us to act slower, think slower, and therefore lead to less optimal care. And what I really want to emphasize throughout my presentation is that once you know it's ICH, don't let your inner clock slow down. You must actually act faster. 
Um, what our stroke neurologist wanted me to emphasize as well is that once you get these patients through the first critical hours and first few days, if you get them to survive, then overall they can do better than ischemic stroke survivors. So our decisions, our actions in the emergency department can really impact the uh, clinical course and outcome for these patients. Now to briefly touch on the etiology of spontaneous ICH, um, they can be divided into primary and secondary causes. Primary accounts for 78 to 88% of all causes. It refers to when there's a rupture of a damaged artery or an arterial within the brain. Um, hypertension is the number one cause. It's also the greatest modifiable risk factor. Um, typically, these, brain, these bleeds occur in the deep brain structures like the basal ganglia, the thalamus, sometimes even the brainstem. As you can see from these images, um, this is a basal ganglia. That's where these hypertensive bleeds usually occur. Cerebral amyloid angiopathy typically occur in older patients. Uh, it results from beta amyloid protein deposition in the cortical blood vessels. That makes the vessels weaker and it intends the, increases the tendency for rupture. The location is usually low bar. So as you can see on this diagram, um, and sometimes it can extend into the subarachnoid space. All right, there is a huge list of secondary causes. I'm not gonna go through all of this in detail, but a few specific ones to mention. Number one is coagulopathy. We've seen growing indications for anticoagulation, antiplatelet use uh, in the past decade uh, for various types of ischemic, cardiocerebral vascular diseases. And so this is a rising cause of secondary um, ICH. That's why hemostatic control in these patients is critically important. And I'll discuss the potential roles of reversal agents on later slides. There's also vascular valformations, which were all very familiar with AV malformations, AV fistulas, aneurysms, et cetera. There's cerebral venous thrombosis. Typically this occurs in more younger patients, female, if they're pregnant, if they're on OCP, those type of risk factors. There's primary and metastatic tumors, hemorrhagic conversion of ischemic stroke, and various types of vasculitis that can cause secondary ICH. Now, moving on to the pathophysiology, uh, so ischemic, um, sorry, spontaneous ICH can cause brain injury through several pathophysiologic mechanisms, which I hope to summarize here. So you have blood that's leaking from a rupture vessel and it forms a hematoma. That in itself will cause a direct compressive injury uh, to the brain. And it leads to brain destruction, mass effect, and that can lead to increased ICP, herniation, decrease cerebral perfusion pressure and cerebral edema. Now, the body creates this excitotoxic response to this hematoma development, and that can further lead to oxidative stress, inflammation, disruption of the blood-brain barrier, and lead to cerebral edema, which can then further exacerbate all the primary injuries of increased ICP, decreased CCP, and cerebral ischemia. The hematoma can expand, and this occurs in 40% of patients within the first 24 hours. But then in at least a third of these patients, this, this expansion can happen within the first three hours. And that's typically when these patients present to our emergency department. And so this whole concept is, I think, really important to understand because it ultimately links to the rest of my presentation on the recommended therapies and why we recommend these therapies and the mechanistic rationale behind how it all works. So our overall goal is to figure out how is it that we can inhibit this growth? How can we uh, minimize cerebral edema? And how can we decrease ICP? Clinical features. So an important question to address is how do we distinguish spontaneous ICH from acute ischemic stroke? And the answer to this is there's no clinical findings that are absolutely considered diagnostic. There's no way to 100% tell this clinically, but features that are more suggestive of spontaneous ICH include if there is a sudden onset neurologic deficit that's acute and that's rapidly progressive, that progression is usually due to active bleeding that persists for several hours after the symptom onset. If there's any altered LOC, if there's associated nausea, vomiting, sudden severe headache or seizures, 
And then the type of focal neurologic deficit obviously depend on where the location of the bleeding occurs. So if it's supratentorial, uh, the bleed can cause contralateral sensory or motor deficits, aphasia, neglect, et cetera. If it's infratentorial, so if it affects the cerebellum and the brain stem, um, you can have brain stem manifestations, cranial nerve abnormalities, ataxia, and nystagmus. But bottom line is, once you suspect that there might be a spontaneous ICH, you should get imaging ASAP. On to diagnosis. Um, first line modality is the non-con CT head. And every effort should be made to minimize delays to this initial CT brain. And I think this is where a lot of patient advocacy can come in because we don't want these patients to be waiting an hour or even half an hour in our emergency departments. We should be advocating for them to get to that CT immediately. Um, it's highly sensitive, it's highly specific. That CT non that non-con CT can tell us a lot about the, um, the bleed, specifically the location, any presence or degree of mass effect or midline shift, if there's any hydrocephalus, intraventricular extension, and obviously the size of the hematoma. Guidelines also recommend MRI as first line, but there are obvious logistical constraints in getting that, and it's definitely not the modality of choice if our patients are acutely sick. Um, vascular imaging is often done uh, to look for vascular abnormalities. This should be considered, especially in patients who are female, young, they don't have typical cardiovascular risk factors. There's no history of hypertension, no coagulopathy, and on CT, they have a low bar or significant IV um, intraventricular hemorrhage. Um, at LHSC, because CT is so readily available, we typically get the CT non-con and the CTA done at the same time. Further vascular imaging can be done as an inpatient, so specifically MRA, MRV, or um, DSA, which stands for Digital Subtraction Angiography. But I think bottom line is that in our emergency department, order that CT and CTA right away and leave the rest of the imaging to the inpatient team. All right, so we're gonna move on to medical management. And I've created this hypothetical case to help facilitate the key learning points. Um, this, case, this case does not uh, completely apply to LHSC because we have the stroke team readily available to take over these patients. But I think it's important to still go through a case like this in case we practice at a community site where stroke team is not readily available. So imagine you're the emergency doctor. There's a 57, sorry, 59 year old gentleman who's a farmer. He's brought in via EMS. He complained of acute severe headache, had two episodes of vomiting, followed by some confusion and right-sided weakness just about an hour ago. Past medical history significant from chronic, um, chronic headaches, AFib, hypertension, dyslipidemia. In terms of medications, he takes warfarin, ramipril, rosuvastatin, Tylenol, and naproxen as needed. He has an unremarkable family history. And on arrival, his blood pressure is high, it's 224 over 120, heart rate of 120, respiratory status is okay, and he's febrile at 38.7. GCS is 12, um, and he's only opening his eyes to pain. He follows simple commands. He's able to spontaneously move the left side of his body, but he's got right hemiparesis and hemisensory loss, mild aphasia, and overall NIHSS score is nine. So you're thinking a stroke, or you're thinking, you run through all your differentials, but you have to rule out a stroke. Is it ischemic or hemorrhagic? We're not sure. We're gonna get that CT right away. But you're also concerned about the blood pressure, the 224 over 120. So at this point, we're gonna do our first polling question. All right, so it's activated. The instruction should be at the top of the slide. You can also text this, uh, Text Faith Zoo 649 to 37607. It worked last night when I tried, so you can try that as well. Um, the free version only allows 40 participants. So um, the results will be tallied on a first come first serve basis. So at the bottom of my slide, I see we have six total results. I'm gonna give you guys about 30 seconds.
So the question here is, would you treat this blood pressure prior to CT? And a yes, what's your blood pressure target? Okay, so I think we're almost at a minute. We have a total of 19 results, which is great. Um, there's other polling questions. So this isn't, if you missed out on this question, <laughs> please participate in the upcoming ones. So these are the results, okay. All right, so out of 19 total participants, 42 of you guys said, no, let's get the CT head first. 26 of you said we should lower it to approximately 180 to 220. And then some even um, answered 160 to 180. And then a few of you said 140 to 160 and 120 to 140. All right, okay. I will address the answers to this later. You get the CT, it reveals a large intracranial um, hemorrhage in the left basal ganglia. This is the next polling question. It should be activated now. The CT confirms that there is a bleed. Now, what's your blood pressure target for the next six hours? If you're just joining, um, please participate. All the results are anonymous. We're not going to know. Okay, 10 more seconds. Perfect. Okay, so 27 results, that's great. So after the CT, 44% of participants said they would lower the blood pressure to 160 to 180. Um, and then the next highest answer was 140 to 160. Thank you very much for participating. In the next few slides, I'll address what our guidelines and our experts recommend uh, in terms of blood pressure control. Okay, so elevated BP is quite common um, due to various factors. It could be stress, it could be pain. Uh, patients could have pre-morbid persistent hypertension. And the presumed effect of how blood pressure lowering works is that we think it prevents hematoma expansion. But obviously lowering blood pressure has its, um, has its risks along with its benefits. So, so the risk is that we don't wanna minimize and decrease cerebral perfusion pressure, which could cause ischemic injury. But then on the other hand, if we keep it too high, it could worsen hemorrhage. So our current guidelines and understanding are influenced by two really big trials from the last eight years. I'll talk about them. The first is the Interact 2 trial it came out in 2013. Um, they had over 2,700 uh, patients enrolled. Uh, the goal was to lower blood pressure to less than 140 in the treatment group within one hour and maintain that blood pressure in, for seven days. The control at that time re, uh, received guideline recommended blood pressure lowering to just lower than 180. And the outcome showed that there was actually no difference in the primary outcomes of death or major disability at 90 days. Major disability was um, a modified ranking score of three to six. And then, but then in terms of secondary outcomes, there was a significant favorable shift in the treatment group towards better MRI score, so better functional outcomes and less disability 
for those who received lower blood pressure. There was no difference in hematoma growth at 24 hours. And so the conclusion from this trial was, it was actually widely cited as relatively positive, even though the primary endpoints were neutral, given that they found that the lowering blood pressure was safe and that it could be potentially efficacious. And so that study changed our 2015 AHA ASA guidelines to say that acute lowering of blood pressure to 140 was safe. Um, that was followed by the 2016 TACH2 trial. And the goal of this trial was to determine the efficacy of rapidly lowering blood pressure in an earlier time window after symptom onset than that evaluated and interact. They looked at people who had symptom onset within 4.5 hours instead of six hours. They aggressively lowered the treatment group's blood pressure to 110 to 139. Control was treated to 140 to 179. And their primary outcome was that there was no difference in death or major disability at three months. But then in terms of secondary outcomes, the treatment group had higher renal adverse events. There was no difference in quality of life measurements nor hematoma expansion at 24 hours. And ultimately this trial was stopped early due to futility. So the discrepancy between the results of these two trials have fueled a lot of controversy over the benefits of intensive blood pressure lowering. But we have to recognize a few major differences, which I'd like to highlight here. So number one is the main blood pressure at presentation. In the interact group, you can see that the blood pressure was around 180, whereas attached was 200. So it was 20 millimeters mercury higher in the attached two group. A second important difference was the mean systolic blood pressure achieved. So what you can see is that the treatment group in the interact study is actually comparable in profile to the control group in the attached to study because both were within 140 to 150 range in the one to two hours. And so what we can interpret from this is that the average renal effects and the negative outcomes actually affected those patients in the intervention attached group where they started with really, really high blood pressure of 200, and then it was aggressively lowered to 130 after two hours. A pre-planned pooled analysis combining the individual data from both of these trials was done in 2019. And I think this graph is really interesting. They looked at three variables, so mean blood pressure during the first 24 hours, the variability in blood pressure in the 24 hours, and then the magnitude of blood pressure reduction within the first hour. And what you can see is in terms of outcomes, there's functional recovery, hematoma expansion, neurologic deterioration, death, and adverse ser uh, serious adverse events. That mean blood pressure lowering that's smooth and sustained to even 120 to 130 resulted in better outcomes. But then if you had greater variability in the blood pressure over 24 hours, it led to more adverse outcomes and especially adverse outcomes if you had a magnitude of blood pressure reduction over 60 within the first hour. So all of that taken into consideration changed our Canadian stroke best practice guidelines in 2020. And now the blood pressure, so what they recommended is that, um, well, based on the evidence, what they've stated is that Targeting blood pressure of less than 140 does not worsen neurologic outcomes, but the clinical benefits have yet to be established. But then from a clinical perspective, what they recommended is that targeting less than 140 to 160 during the first 24 to 48 hours can be reasonable. Now, going back to what I asked you guys, what about prior to CT? And unfortunately, at this time, we don't have any um, recommendations, published recommendations to guide us in terms of how to control the blood pressure prior to CT. And remember, prior to CT, it's very hard to tell the difference between ischemic versus spontaneous ICH. And for ischemic strokes, the guidelines clearly tell us that if the patient's a candidate for thrombolytics, we should target their blood pressure to less than 185 over 110. But if they're not for thrombolytics, we should only treat their blood pressure if it's greater than 220. Um, and reduce that by 15%, no more than 25% over the first 24 hours. And so I asked all our experts what their recommendations are. 
So prior to CT, all of them said nothing should delay getting that CT head. So I think that received the most amount of votes. So you guys were correct. At LHSC, we have CT readily available. So get that patient the CT head. If you're concerned with their extremely high blood pressure, you can have your antihypertensives ready, like drawn up, ready to go while the patient's getting their CT. And once the diagnosis is confirmed, you can start titrating with small boluses at bedside. If that CT is not available, so if you're at a community hospital and you're arranging transfer to a nearest stroke or uh, center that can get a CT, aim for a blood pressure of 200 to 220 if the blood pressure is sustained over 220 initially. Um, don't get too um, bogged down on the exact number because it's really hard to achieve perfect titration. After the CT, the recommendation is that once it's confirmed to be ICH, aim for 140 to 160 uh, in the first few hours, and but obviously avoid rapid aggressive blood pressure drops. So if the patient had a blood pressure of 220 when they came in, don't aggressively titrate it down to 140 within the first two hours. Um, after 24 hours in the inpatient setting, the team can consider further blood pressure reduction if there's no complications like renal failure. All right. And then in terms of antihypertensives, which agents should we use? Um, in speaking to our experts, they mentioned that there's no strong grade evidence to support any one over the other. What we're gonna use is gonna depend on our familiarity, what we're comfortable with, what's available at our teaching or at our practice sites. At LHSC, labetalol and hydralazine are the most readily available. I'm not gonna go into the dosing or the contraindications, but from a practical point, um, both are in the front bubble pixels at VIC. Neither of them are in the trauma room. At UH, they're randomly distributed among the pod A and front bubble pixels. And then at St. Joe's, both are in the pixels as well. Uh, enalaprat is the IV form of enalapril. Um, it is available, it's only from the pharmacy, so it's less readily available. And then the cardipine, which I think um, is first line in most places in the States, um, it is available, but it's only special access from Health Canada. It has to be delivered from Montreal. So definitely not first line in our eMERGE. Um, okay, back to the case. So that concludes the hypertension management section. Um, back to the case, um, we have this 59 year old gentleman, we confirmed that he has a spontaneous ICH and then on review of medications, you remember that he's on warfarin. Okay, third poll, um, the patient is on warfarin, would you give reversal agents? So the options are, you would give four-factor PCC and vitamin K on spec prior to labs. Second question is four-factor PCC plus vitamin K after labs. You would speak to the neuro, uh, neurology or neurosurgeon first, and you're not sure. Okay, all right, I think we'll end it there. Okay, so 54% of participants voted for the first answer, which is um, you would give everything prior to labs. Um, but then we have patient or we have people answering um, all four options, 4% said not sure, which is great because this is why we're here. We're here to figure out what, what to exactly do. Um, I'm gonna activate this poll as well. Uh, I think it should be activated, yeah. 
So this question is, if the patient was taking war for, or sorry, taking aspirin instead, would you give platelets? Okay, we'll stop it there. Okay, it's pretty, pretty even split between no and only give if they're thrombocytopenic with platelet say of less than 50,000. All right. So we'll go through those questions. Um, in the following slides or the answers to those questions. So reversing coagulopathy is important. Back to our pathophysiology slide. Uh, the reason why it's important is because we wanna prevent further bleeding and hematoma expansion. Um, so for this section, I've gathered the recommendations from the Neurocritical Care Society 2016 guidelines and the Canadian Stroke Best Practice 2020 guidelines. Uh, this table shows the reversal agents for the anticoagulants our patients might be taking, uh, most commonly warfarin and your DOAX. I'm not going to go into this in detail. I'm going to comment on a few important points. So number one, to answer the first question, with warfarin, you should be giving vitamin K, 10 milligrams IV, and four-factor PCC immediately after diagnosis this reversal should not be delayed while you're waiting for a lab. So you don't have to wait for that labs to tell you that INR is greater than 1.5. At LHSC, from a practice point, the four-factor PCC is either octoplex or bariplex. It has to be provided, um, it's weight-based dosing, not INR dosing. It's different at every institution, but here it's weight-based. In terms of DOAX, um, you can consider activated charcoal within two hours of ingestion for both um, your direct uh, 10A inhibitors and your dabigatran, but obviously watch for contraindications like if the patient had deteriorating mental status and is unable to protect their airway. At LHSC, you would give four-factor PCC because the dexanet nor uh, activated PCC are available. Uh, Proxbine, so idaritsitsumab, is available for dabigatran. It's available from the pharmacy, so you would have to call for that. Now moving on to more controversial topics. So what about antiplatelets? So patients who are taking aspirin, clopidogrel, ticagrelor, diperidomol, and they have a bleed. At this time, our guidelines tell us to not transfuse in the absence of significant thrombocytopenia because it may be harmful. And this is based on the PATCH trial. So this is a trial that was published in 2016 it's the first and largest RCT, even though it's relatively small with only 190 participants, that looked at platelet transfusion in patients who had antiplatelet-associated ICH. So treatment group received platelets. The control received standard care that wasn't clearly defined. But what the results showed was that there was increase in death, dependence, and increased serious adverse events for patients who received platelets. One thing to know about this study was that the generalizability was uncertain because they, um, most of the patients involved only took aspirin. They didn't take clopidogrel or ticagrelor. Um, they excluded patients who had large intraventricular hemorrhages and those that needed prompt surgical indications. Because at this point, most people still receive platelets um, if it's low, um, if they're going for surgery. So, what if there's thrombocytopenia? So if they're taking an antiplatelet and their platelet count is really low. So say less than 100,000 or less than 50,000. What our experts recommend is right now, there's no evidence base to provide a broad generalizable answer. We shouldn't be making these cutoff values for 
automatic calls for transfusion. So if a patient has a count that's less than 100,000, uh, their recommendation is to speak with the hematologist first to figure out why, and certainly speak with the neurosurgeon Neurosurgeon, if the patient is definitely going for surgery. So at this point, routine platelet uh, transfusion is not recommended, even if there is thrombocytopenia. Now, what about TXA? So the benefits of TXA and um, major traumas have also increased their interest in seeing its potential benefits in spontaneous ICH. Uh, there's been some studies that have shown feasibility and well tolerability with TXA. And the largest trial was the TITCH trial, which came out in 2018. Um, they looked at patients who had ICH within eight hours of onset. Uh, they treated them with one gram of TXA over 10 minutes, followed by one gram over eight hours. They compared them to control who were given normal saline at the following the same timeline. The results show that there was no difference in functional status at 90 days, but the treatment group had less hematoma expansion, less hematoma volume, less death rates at seven days, and less serious adver adverse events. There was no difference in clotting and no difference in death at 90 days. And so from this, we can see that although there was no difference in functional status, TXA might be safe. But what our guidelines and our experts still recommend is that right now we don't have enough evidence. While it's promising, the secondary outcomes are at most hypothesis generating. They're not recommending routine TXA um, transfusions. And at this time, further studies are needed. Um, there are currently trials that are ongoing investigating TXA treatment and those taking no acts. All right, so the case continues. Um, after an hour in the eMERGE, patient deteriorates to GCS of seven, not obeying commands, sonorous and shallow breaths, heart rate is slow, blood pressure is still very high. You're suspecting raised ICP and possible brain herniation. And at this time, you're gonna do neuroprotective intubation, keep head of bed elevated and provide appropriate analgesia and sedation. Would you give hyperosmolar therapy at this point? Okay. I think this is the fifth polling question. Give you 10 more seconds. Okay, so these are our results. Um, almost 50% of participants said, sorry, let me see, either would work. Um, and then the second highest choice was 3% hypertonic saline, followed by mannitol. Okay. So the reason why we would consider hyperosmolar therapy is to help um, with the cerebral edema and the elevated ICP. Um, as we know, there's definitely great debates in literature regarding which one is better, hypertonic saline versus mannitol. Um, just a bit of discussion about both of them. So mannitol is a natural sugar alcohol. It acts as an osmotic diuretic. There are adverse effects with mannitol secondary to this osmotic diuresis. It can lead to electrolyte imbalances like hypokalemia, hyponatremia, 
um, AKI, and it can uh, significantly decrease intravascular volume, which can lead to decreased blood pressure and compromised CPP. So from a practice point, it's very important to have a fully catheter and to monitor the osmotic diuresis and to replenish the fluids with um, isoosmotic fluids like normal saline. The dose is 0.5 to 1.5 grams per kilogram over 10 minutes through a peripheral IV. Um, hypertonic saline works by creating an osmotic gradient that draws water from the cerebral tissue into the intravascular space. And it's good for rapid CSF absorption, it expands the intravascular volume, it promotes positive inotropy and that can augment our cerebral perfusion pressure. In terms of adverse effects, it can also lead to electrolyte imbalances, uh, specifically hypernatremia, hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, AKI volume overload, and CF, CS, CHF exacerbation. From a practice point, um, lower concentrations, so 2%, 3% can be delivered safely through a peripheral IV, but then anything higher should require central access. Uh, we have the 3% hypertonic saline pre-mixed bags in the 250 cc's, um, in the 250 cc bags, and it can be given over 10 to 15 minutes. So which one does our uh, guidelines recommend? So the Canadian best uh, stroke best practice guidelines recommend that either can be used as temporizing measures when there's clinical signs of herniation, but the uh, Neurocritical Care Society guidelines actually recommended hypertonic saline over mannitol, but recognizing that this was very low quality evidence and their rationale was that hypertonic saline was a, at least as a safe and effective as mannitol, but there is the added advantage that it is good for fluid resuscitation and uh, it can um, maintain good cerebral perfusion pressure. What our experts recommend is that you should choose what's available, give the right dose, and give the right route. There is some variation in practice um, in terms of when to give it. So some of our experts recommended giving it if you're severely concerned about increased ICP and the, the patient has acutely deteriorating mental status, instead of waiting when they're showing active signs of herniation like a blown pupil, because at that point, it might be too late. Others recommend just giving it when they're showing signs of clinical herniation, but obviously get neurosurgery involved right away because neither of these medications are known to improve neurologic outcomes and it's used just as a bridging therapy to definitive management. Um, from a practice point, um, so interestingly, so at Vic, we have both hypertonic saline and mannitol in the trauma rooms. At UH, only mannitol is in the recess room, and then 3% hypertonic saline can be found in pod A pixes. And then there's no hypertonic saline at St. Joe's. There's only mannitol in the, I believe, the supply room. All right, so the case continues. Um, at this point, you consult neuro and neurosurgery, and they ask, why didn't you consult sooner? But obviously none of us would <laughs> make that mistake because we would consult them right away after the CT. Uh, in the meantime, they ask you to optimize other methods of neuroprotection. And so most of the neuroprotective uh, methods are done in the inpatient setting, but there are a few things that we can keep in mind and start in the emergency department to help prevent secondary injury. The first is glucose management. Um, hyperglycemia is common in these patients and it's associated with worse outcomes. Um, but studies have shown that if you try to aggressively manage the glucose, it can lead to increased incidences of cerebral hyperglycemic, hypoglycemic events, which actually also increases mortality. So the goal is to avoid both hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. If the blood pressure, if the blood sugar is between four to 10, don't, don't do anything about it. Don't tightly manage it. But if it's greater than 10, you can consider giving small doses of rapid acting insulin. In terms of temperature management, um, this is interesting because fever is actually quite common. You'll see in 30 to 50% of patients who have spontaneous ICH. And I wanna 
point out this point is because if a patient presents with acute confusion, deteriorating mental status, and they have a fever, there are other things that are on our differential, like any infectious processes, meningitis, encephalitis, or even toxidromes. But don't forget to rule out this, this very concerning diagnosis of a uh, potential brain bleed when a patient presents with that fever. Uh, fever is associated with worse outcomes. Hypothermia is thought to reduce perihematoma edema, but there's no strong RCT evidence for this. So the guidelines recommend at this point to just keep a normal core temperature and treat fevers that are above 38. Uh, and then lastly, in terms of seizure and seizure prophylaxis, um, Guidelines do not recommend use of prophylactic anticonvulsants. Uh, it's associated with increased death and disability. Um, but if the patient is having an active seizure, which is common, um, you'll see it in 8 to 31% of patients within 14 days of symptom onset. Then, and if they're seizing in our emergency department, we should treat them um, typically with benzos first and then with anti-epileptic uh, drugs like phenytoin or Keppra, whatever is available. Okay, lastly, I wanna to touch on neurosurgical interventions. Um, so when I asked our stroke neurologist what it is that we can improve in our emergency department to optimize their care, um, a couple of them commented on understanding what type of bleeds are surgical and which ones are non-surgical so that we can com consult the appropriate services. So most brain bleeds are supratentorial. These are the ones that occur in the deep, basal ganglia, and the internal capsule in the lobar region. Um, there's a lot of clinical equipoise regarding whether surgery um, is beneficial. And I think from most RCTs and meta-analyses, it has not shown any benefit with early surgical intervention. So again, most supratentorial bleeds are non-surgical, especially in patients who are conscious. If they have stable GCS, they have a small bleed, there's no mass effect and there's no intraventricular extension. Um, but if these patients start to acutely deteriorate or on CT there is intraventricular extension or mass effect or hydrocephalus, then you should consult neurosurgery early. If the bleed is infratentorial, so if it affects the cerebellum or the brainstem, because the posterior fossa is an uh, enclosed space, um, there is a high risk of herniation and brainstem compression hydrocephalus. So in these cases, you should consult neurosurgery right away, despite the lack of randomized evidence for this. All right. So I think I've talked enough. Thank you all for participating in our polls. I think that was quite fun. Um, the takeaways from this presentation, uh, number one is what we do in the merge matters, especially in the first critical hours, because that can really uh, change a patient's uh, clinical outcome and course. Uh, number two, don't delay that CT. Three, consult the right services, neuro, uh, sorry, stroke plus minus neurosurgery right away. In terms of blood pressure control, down to 140 to 160 is safe, but obviously avoid precipitous and large blood pressure drops. Reverse your anticoagulants, um, but there's no evidence right now for antiplatelet reversal, platelet transfusions, or TXA. And then from a neuroprotection perspective, give hyperosmolar therapy if indicated, um, aim for normal thermia, normal glycemia, and treat active seizures, and then know your indications for surgical referral. But obviously, if you're not sure, um, definitely consult them right away. Okay. I think I've talked for long enough. I will open it to questions. I think Dr. Ka said that he was able to join for the last bit of this presentation. I'm not sure if he's here. Yes, I'm here. Oh, hi. Thank you so much for joining. Good morning, Dr. Chu. And happy to uh, address any questions if you would like me to join in. In faith, it looks like Catherine Lott has uh, just asked a question about neuroprotective strategies during RSI for ICH. Right, okay. So <laughs> I did add, um, add a part about intubation, which we cut out from this presentation because I was going way over time, but I do have slides prepared for intubation considerations. Um, 
So um, you should definitely pre-oxygenate. Um, if the patient is difficult uh, to pre-oxygenate, you can consider a delay sequence intubation with giving them um, a subdissociative dose of ketamine to help facilitate that pre-oxygenation process. In terms of intubation, uh, to prevent increased ICP, um, there has been studies that have shown that video laryngoscopy is better than direct to prevent that over manipulation of the airway, which can cause a reflex sympathetic response. And then in terms of pre-treatment, I think the evidence for lidocaine is really, really weak. So this is pretty much run out of practice. Um, Fentanyl has better evidence for blunting the sympathetic response, but the caveat is the dose is really high. And truthfully, I've never seen this being used like two to five mics per kilogram over six minutes. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have any experience using this or this is um, routine in your practice. And then in terms of induction agents, um, Atomidate is ideal. Um, I know it's in Windsor. I'm not sure if we use it here, but what I'm most commonly um, used to is ketamine. Um, I think there's been path myths about it increasing ICP, but this has long been refuted. Propofol is not preferred because um, it can cause um, the bl blood pressure to be quite labile. It can decrease your blood pressure and decrease PP. All right. And then- It looks like- <clears throat> Oh, sorry, Lucky, just care. Confirmed, we have Atomidate, finally. We have Atomidate, okay, thank you. And um, it looks like Julie's chimed in and said that she used fentanyl for treatment, for pre-treatment and those doses when the patient's blood pressure can handle it. Okay, gotcha. And the, Julie also asked a question and maybe um, Dr. Kaw could weigh in on this one, um, but she said, I'm just scrolling up here that, um, so did our colleagues mention a time frame for symptom onset in ICH for which we should activate a stroke code? So we're currently not activating a code stroke in patients with known diagnosed intracerebral hemorrhage. You would only activate a code stroke um, with the current um, algorithm before um, knowing that it is an ICH. Right, so if there's stroke symptoms, the walk-in patient, um, the way it's currently being practiced at London Health Sciences Centre, uh, and also at um, Urgent Care Clinic at St. Joe's, um, please continue with that. If for whatever reasons the patient was not um, triaged as a code or, or a, um, a stroke protocol, as a walk-in stroke protocol, and for example, just the non-specific or non-focal decreased level of consciousness um, and you get a CT scan and then you find out that's an ICH, you're currently not um, um, activating a code stroke, but of course, uh, feel free to uh, immediately call the uh, stroke consultant on service and, and discuss and if uh, and, and then we'll, we'll see the patient or we'll transfer the patient from UCC to UH emergency department promptly. Thank you for your answer. Um, I'm just going through the chat to see if there are other questions that we missed. Okay, Mo asked um, if there are any blood pressure parameters that would influence choosing hypertonic saline versus mannitol. Um, I wonder if one may increase blood pressure and the other may decrease it. Yeah, so I think if the patient is hypotensive, you would avoid mannitol because it's an osmotic diuresis. Um, if you don't replace their fluids with normal saline at the same rate of the loss, uh, then you can significantly cause hypotension. But if the patient is hypertensive and they're hemodynamically stable, I think either would be an okay choice. Let's see if I can look. Whoops, I went too far. My bad. Okay, I think I think those are all our questions. Uh, 
That's great, Faith. And Lauren, thank you so much. And thank you to our guest uh, experts too. And thank you so much, Dr. Kwa. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I did have a few comments. Not sure if there's time for that. Yeah, for sure. Please. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, this was an excellent presentation, um, very well done and, and great participation. Uh, thank you for that. Um, you mentioned that Indexanet is not available. That is correct that it is not available through regular means. I just wanted to let you know and the EDs currently um, our department is participating in a randomized control trial using Andexanet in patients with ICH, so it would only be available for ICH, not for other systemic bleeds in patients who are using um, um, the factor 10A inhibitors, any one of the factor 10A inhibitors of the three of them that are approved in Canada. Um, <clears throat> so, um, but that, that is a pretty laborious laborious trial. So we're only offering that with because we need the stroke uh, nurses, research nurses for support during the daytime hours. But if during the daytime, if a patient does not come in by stroke protocol anyway, um, for other reasons is found to have an acute ICH, I think it's within six hours. So it, they have to be enrolled within six hours. There are during daytime, Monday to Friday um, options um, by then letting the uh, stroke physician on call know immediately um, to get to get hold of Indexanet. Um, one other comment with the anticonvulsants. So, um, Faith, very good that you pointed out that there's absolutely no role for prophylactic treatment with anticonvulsants. But <clears throat> with the very weak evidence that we have um, so far, it actually does not seem to be um, um, uh, irrelevant which anticonvulsant, if a patient has acute um, symptomatic seizures, um, phenytoin is the one that, um, at least in retrospective analysis, seems to be the one who has who's been driving um, the outcome, the worst outcomes with worse morbidity and death. Um, so I would rather suggest, even though this is very weak evidence, but if you want to use the data that have been published, then phenytoin, which unfortunately is, of course, the easiest available one, should actually not be used in these patients. Rather, try to work with benzodiazepines, of course, trying to not severely sedate the patient to an extent that the patient is not accessible anymore, or levetiracetam. That's a great point. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Um, we will end the presentation here. Thanks. Good work, Faith. Thank you.